in persona Christi. See, there are so many things about the ordination of our priest that we don't know about because in the last 30 years, not the role of the priest, but I would have to say the respect of the priest has gone down somewhat. And part of it is their fault and part of it is our fault. We become buddies and we want to be your friend, but you are really on, you have to be on that list. He's in the person of Christ. You He's Christ person, among us. You bought it. You're in the person of Christ. Do we kiss our priest's hand? In Mexico, in Mexico they, still, they still kiss their priest's hand. It's if you believe that he brings you life eternal, if you believe that he is there in the person of Christ himself, then you revere him, don't you? Can I now say this thing about so, St. John Chrysostom? Yeah, you could. It fits in. It, it doesn't fit. Right. Do, you, do you want to say that? <laughs> <laughs> now you're taking the fun out of it. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. We had a doctor of the church in the early church. His name was St. John Chrysostom. And he wrote tremendously about the Eucharist and about the Mass. See, we don't really know what goes on in our Mass. And we will, one day, we're going to do this. We are going to make a program. Very soon. And it's going to be explaining the entire Mass. We, we did that in our second book on the miracles of the Eucharist. We wrote one-third of the book about the roots of the Mass, where the Mass comes from, where all the traditions, all the things that we do on the altar, why we do them, where they come from in the Old Testament roots, where they come from in the different councils. But we want to show that to you on a video because nobody reads. Anyway. Oh, yes, they do. But it, so but anyway, it, i got to finish it's, this. But it's graphic. St. John just, Chrysostom, you, top, no, my turn. But just tell, no, tell, no, tell, no, them, no, tell no. them one of their priests help us with it. One of your priests from the holy state of Louisiana helped edit that second book on the miracles of the Eucharist, the section on so the feel mass. proud. Actually, two priests from yes. Louisiana. One of them one from Lafayette. is from Lafayette, and the other one is actually from Houston, Texas, but he's stationed here in Louisiana, so it counts. That's right. right? Okay. <laughs> so those two priests edited that book, and, they, and what they would do is, it's kind of interesting, we wrote a lot of things about feelings that we have when things happen on the altar. And what's really happened. And our priest would write in the, in the margin of the, of the galley proofs that we sent them some of their feelings, some of their oh. insights, things that they experienced while they were celebrating the mass. It chokes you. It really does. I, what, I do want to get back to this thing that I want to tell you. Just tell me no, about, the, no. about the cross. The, the, no. The, the, the cross. No. Here we go. So St. John Chrysostom later. said to the people, when you begin the consecration of the Mass, when our priest begins the consecration of the Mass, he puts his hands over the bread and wine. If you listen to the words, he summons down the Holy Spirit. You listen. Think about Next that. Next time we have Mass, listen to the words of the priest. Or read them in your missalette. He summons down the Holy Spirit. Now the angels who are higher than man do not have the power to summon down the Holy Spirit. But our priest, by his consecrated hands, the gift has of holy given orders. the power to summon down the Holy Spirit. And as the Holy Spirit comes down on the altar, he's accompanied by tens of thousands of, of angels, angels all over the altar. This is why we need such big altars for our Catholic Church. We need room for all the angels. St. John used to say to the people, get away from the main altar. We need room for the angels. So this is how exciting our Mass is, number one. And this is why we want to make this program explaining the Mass. And number two, this is one of the gifts, the powers that our priest has been given by virtue of his ordination. The second uh, part of this miracle that is so important is that the blood petrified into five pellets. And I know you're all smart. I didn't and know why. And the priest why. asked why do you us, think why five, five pellets? pellets? Does anybody know why five pellets? There's so, See, now, either you're watching the knew, program or we, you are really smart. We knew <laughs> nothing. I couldn't think of Real it. Real idiots. Anyway, the five wounds of Christ. Five wounds of Christ. When they tested the blood, and let us tell you a little bit about blood, when you bleed and it goes on a Band-Aid or on a cloth, Within 15 minutes, 
It is no longer blood. It has lost all the properties of blood. All the chemicals, all the proteins of blood all are gone. All the nutrients gone. are gone. It is just a stain. That's all it is. Now we, everything that's in our book is documented. So you, you can really rest on that. So when we, we knew we had, we knew we had heard it at the shrine, but we didn't know the source. And so we couldn't, if we said, if we can't find the source, we've got to take it out of the book. Can't put it in. So we called our local hospital in, in Southern California, the pathology department, and we asked them the question. And they said, not only is that true, but when you donate blood and they put it in those little plastic bags, if you do not refrigerate it within one hour, it begins to break down and pretty soon you have nothing but red liquid. Now, so that's one hour of blood not refrigerated will break down. We're setting you up for a big, big climax here. When they did the investigation on the blood. They got permission to liquefy a tiny particle what do you think they found? They found all the properties, nutrients, chemicals. proteins, chemical composition of freshly shed blood. 1,300 years later. When they did what appears to look like an electrocardiogram. Of the blood. Of the blood, and they tested it. When there is no life, what do you see? You know, we watch ER. Everybody what watches see? ER. And you see that straight dead, line, go, right? Bzzz. You watch ER, they go bzzz when somebody dies. And when they're not dead, when, what do you when, see? What do you see when they're not you dead? You see that broken beep, line beep, beep, of beep, beep, life. Beep, 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 beep. Now, everybody join the fool. So when they What do you this, think is on that gram? That, like, when they on. did the Good girl. Good. Come on. Beep, Come on. Beep, beep, if beep, I can do it, you can do it. Come on. Come on. Yes, yes. There good. you go. She's there good. you go. Beep, 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 beep. They, they found life. What is God saying? First with the heart, he says, I am the heart, the life of this church, and I come to life on that altar. And then what is he saying? He's saying with that blood, I am with you. I am alive. Ongoing. Not just during the consecration, but all the time that the host is in the tabernacle until the host is distributed, Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist. Now, leads us to another point. Why, why has this miracle, miracle been given to us? So that... When we look at our Lord Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament during Eucharistic adoration, we know that Jesus is truly with us, proof positive. This is proof positive with this miracle of the Eucharist, which is still there, gives us proof positive that Jesus is truly present in the tabernacle, in the, in the monstrance, when we have Eucharistic adoration. And Jesus is waiting for you and for me to come in and share and talk. Um, I think Jesus would be the only one that I've ever heard of where you can go and speak to him and he will give you 100% of his attention. Now, isn't that true? Even with your loved ones, isn't there times when you're talking to them and you see kind of a, a glaze go over their eyes. Yeah? Sometimes you young mothers, we have, we have young mothers here, young mothers when your husband comes home at night and you have not had an adult conversation all day long. I mean, all you've had is Google Gaga, change my diapers, and you want an adult conversation. Honey, I'm so glad you're home. I want to talk to you. I'm exhausted. And he pops open a can of beer and plops in front of the TV and just collapses. How about Let's when somebody is talking to you? Do you ever notice someone, you're talking to somebody and their eyes start to travel? Huh? We don't listen. It's human, but we don't listen. Very often, we're just waiting for that person to stop talking so we can say something. No, we're waiting for them to take a breath. Take a breath. <laughs> Did you ever see that happen to you? Well, he took a breath. Okay, I here I go, you know? But Jesus adores you. Waits for you. Waits he adores for you. you. And each, okay, now we're going to do a little, uh, a little uh, 
th a little practice that we do. We're going to look at each other. Oh, yeah, you want okay. to, you this is something we, we always do just to bring a point across. We want every one of you to look at the person on your right. Now, if, if you feel self-conscious, then take a quick look. Don't let them see you doing it. But everybody look at the person. Now, no kissing. No kissing. No kissing. Okay, a little kissing. <laughs> that person that you just looked at is a one-of-a-kind, unique creation of Jesus. One-of-a-kind. No one has ever been created quite like that person that you just Isn't that true? At. Nobody. And when Jesus finished with you, he said, it is good. It is beautiful. This is my creation. So when you come to our Lord Jesus in the Eucharist to talk to him, this is his beautiful creation that's coming to visit with him. And of course, he's going to give you all the time that you need. And you can talk to him and talk to him and spill your heart out. And at some given point, stop and open your heart to listen. Because Jesus will speak to you. Sometimes people tell me, um, I try, but my mind wanders. I go to the Blessed Sacrament. It's really hard when, when you're suffering. There are times when people are suffering. They may be abandoned. Husband, wife might have left them. They're in the deepest throes of, of sorrow. They don't know where to turn. And they go to the Blessed Sacrament and they tell us, I feel nothing. I wonder if it's because at that moment they are not really personalizing. They're not really seeing, because it takes faith to believe, doesn't it? It takes faith to look at a monstrance, at what appears to be a host, and to believe that this is Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity, the God-man, Jesus the God-man. It takes faith. And that's why he left you miracles of the Eucharist. For if you are like me, and we travel all over the world, and sometimes, except, thank God, in this part of the Holy world. Holy Louisiana. But there are parts, even in this beautiful country of ours, where you cannot hear the gospel expounded in the, with the same truth. And somebody is making up his own ideas about what Jesus is or is not saying then you have to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus is in your church you and need, he's present. You need something to hang on to. When things get very difficult in our lives, and things do in all of our lives, at some given time, things get to the point where we don't think we can handle much more. Nobody can understand our wounds. You can go to Jesus in the Eucharist, he understands every wound that you have ever experienced. He's experienced everything that you have ever experienced. Now, there is a miracle of the Eucharist that happened, and I think it's one that's kind of a consolation for those of us who really go through the dark night of the soul but don't know that's what we're doing. Because if you knew you were going through the dark night of the soul, you'd feel pretty good about it. you say, well, okay, Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross before me and many, many of the saints. The dark night of the soul is when you feel nothing, when you don't feel Jesus talking to you, when you when feel... When you're going through your ministry, you just have no feelings, no emotional feelings at all. St. Teresa of Avila, one of the great doctors of our church, went through 20 years of dryness, spiritual dryness, what we call the dark night of the soul. And she did some of her best writing during that period. But anyway, when you go through that, remember this miracle. There was a priest and... In a town called in Siena. Yes. And a farmer had become... Uh, dangerously ill. He was at the point of death and the, and the wife ran to the, the priest and, and asked him to come and to give him the last rites. I guess the priest was a little tired. 
Maybe he was. In those days, they wouldn't have said burnt out, but today we would. And instead of taking the host, consecrated host, reverently placing it in a pyx and carrying it near his heart, he just tossed it between the pages of his breviary, put it under his arm, and went to the farmer's house. He prepared the farmer and then went to give him communion. He opened up the breviary, and what he saw were two blood-stained pages. The host was gone. And he had the, instead, what was left were two blood-stained pages. I went to confession to a very holy priest in Siena, who was from the town of Kasha, where St. Rita is, is, had her ministry, and he confessed to what had happened. And the priest, blessed Simone Fedati, his name was, gave him absolution, but he took the two pages from him. And one of them he brought to a, uh, an Augustinian monastery near Assisi, and the other one is in that chapel. They built a special chapel in honor of this, what they call miracle of the Eucharist of Kasha. And it's there today, that page, the bloodstained page, and over these centuries, sort of a miracle within a miracle has taken place because the blood has shifted position so that when you look at the page, you can see a profile of the face of Christ on the page. Now, with you and me, if somebody treated us that way, we wouldn't have bled for them, would we? He bled. He bled so that his son would know that he loved him and that he was with him. Now there's a, there was a priest. He's been transferred since then, but his name was Father Justino. He's in that video that whoever has seen it, and if you haven't seen it, make sure you get it. <laughs> At any rate, Father Justino was the custodian of the shrine, and he shared with us, because he heard Penny saying to the pilgrims, that this priest had been burned out. And he was just going through the motions. Just going you know? through the motions. Spiritual dryness. And this Father Justino said to Penny, I am the custodian of this shrine. And I am here every day with the miracle of the Eucharist. And I believe in that miracle of the Eucharist. He said, I, when I was a little boy, I used to spend hours in, for, in front of the Blessed Sacrament. I believed. I must say I have never stopped believing in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, but? But there are days when I prepare for Mass and I just go through the motions. Even though I have this miracle of the Eucharist here with me, he said we need to be able to share with the people and spread this miracle of the Eucharist and all the miracles of the Eucharist to the people to focus them in on what happens here in our church during the sacrifice of the Mass. See, because according to the Council of Trent, which is the greatest council about the Eucharist, the Mass, the Eucharistic celebration is the ongoing sacrifice of the cross. During our Mass, we experience the entire passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. It's an ongoing sacrifice. Did you know that? And that's another exciting thing about our Mass that we don't know. We don't tell our people anymore. It's just so exciting, the things that go on in our church. How can you be bored from the moment the mass begins and the altar boy, I hope he's an altar boy. Altar person. <laughs> Let's say altar boy. Let's, let me feel good. Is carrying the crucifix down the aisle. What do you see? Do you see Jesus carrying his cross? Because that's what he symbolizes. During the offertory, that's not a high point in the Mass, is it? But it is. It is. At that moment, we are, should be offering ourselves. Lord, here I am. 
Do with me what you will. I am all yours. If we start the Mass with the realization and we see Jesus carrying that cross, the Mass is going to take on different meaning. Your Lord is having an unbloody sacrifice of the cross on that altar. Cut.